Well, we are here. We are in the Christmas season, and I'm super excited to be with you as we kick off our Christmas series called The Chronicles of Christmas, Their Story, Our Story. And so we're going to be kicking off this new series that's going to take us uh, up uh, through Christmas Eve. So I pray that you would just really lean into these uh, uh, this particular series. We're going to have fun, okay? And here in a few moments, I'm going to explain a little bit more how we're going to do it, and you're going to... Um, you're going to see how that's all going to be pulled off. But before we do that, we got because we got some special things that will make this series really, I think, really creative and intimate. And it's either going to go well or it's going to be a struggle. I think it's going to go well because you guys are praying for me and it's going to happen. And we're going to have a great time worshiping Jesus as we reflect on his birth in this Christmas season. Before we do that though, I want to share a verse to you that we're going to use today and I think it's a very powerful because we're going to a very powerful verse because we're going to be talking about gifts. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Let me read that one more time. For it is by your grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And we're gonna talk about that here in just a few moments. Before we do that though, we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing a song together, and then we'll close out with another song after our teaching. But I pray that you would just, uh, again, interact. I pray that you would just um, stand and anticipate and worship and, and you know anticipate encountering God in a very intimate way. Merry Christmas, and I'm looking forward to this series with you. Let's stand, let's worship this morning.
Here's a little Christmas story from a friend of mine called Stupid Gift. When I was a kid growing up in Dearborn, Michigan, our family opened presents on Christmas Eve. I don't know why we did it that way, but I never complained. We had to wait until after the Christmas Eve service at our Free Methodist Church. We wanted to go, but even if we didn't want to, we would have had to go because Dad was the pastor. The parsonage was next door to the church, only a few feet from the side door. We'd rush home, beside ourselves with excitement. The doorbell would ring constantly as church members dropped by one more small gift, a candle, a plate of cookies, another fruitcake. We were rich, and all the world was right on this night. Most of the presents had incubated under the tree for a while. Two weeks earlier, my dad had loaded everyone into the station wagon, and we all went to the Kmart over on Van Bourne. It was a family ritual. My older brother Paul, who was 10, and I were allotted $5 each to spend. I was eight years old. My sister Carol was five. She tagged along with my mother. My youngest brother, Steve, was three. He just rode in my dad's cart and pulled stuff off the shelves. Paul and I each secured our own shopping carts. Then we took off through the store, sneaking down the aisle and keeping ourselves aware of where the other was. The game was that you had to make your way around the store and through the checkout line without being seen until everything was paid for and safely bagged up. More often than not, it didn't work. I'd turn a corner and run right into my brother's cart. We'd accuse each other of spying, then speed off in opposite directions. It was odd how often we ended up getting each other the same thing or variations of the same thing. I don't know if it was just that we were brothers or I was just not so original, but the previous year, I bought Paul a Bat Masterson 45 RPM record. It cost 49 cents. Bat Masterson was a TV Western hero who carried a cane, wore a vested suit, and a derby hat. He beat up bad guys with his cane without getting his suit dirty and shot guns out of their hands with a tiny Derringer pistol he kept in his vest pocket. His name was Bat, Bat Masterson. Paul bought me a 45 RPM record as well. It was babes in Toyland. Not quite the same. For several weeks after Christmas, I listened to the Bat Masterson record quite a bit. I don't remember listening to the babes in Toyland record. I thought it was my brother's plot to keep me a little kid for another year. The previous spring, we both had discovered plastic model kits. I had built my first model car that I bought with my birthday money. It was a model of the Roadster that the TV Munsters drove. It ended up with airplane glue blotched all over it, but it was mine and I was proud of it. Paul had built a couple model cars too. I headed over to the hobby section. They had model cars, planes, motorcycles, and boats. The boxes were stacked eight feet high. I couldn't spend much. I noticed a small model of a battleship for a dollar and 49 cents. That was perfect, so I bought it. My dad liked chocolate-covered cherries. Those were easy. Mom was a bit harder to buy for. I remembered something she said back on Thanksgiving. She announced to no one in particular that she needed a new can opener. I was in the kitchen when she said it. My dad was there too, and when we heard her say it, his eyes met mine, and he kind of winked. That's what I would get for her a new can opener. I wheeled around to find the kitchen supply section, ran into my brother again, said a few choice words, then made my way to the can openers. They had a basket full of nice shiny ones, the kind where you clamp down on a can and then turned a little handle until the top came off. The handles had grips like pliers, so you could crack nuts with them. It looked like it worked real good and it was only a dollar and 19 cents, she would love it. For Carol, I found a little doll that had a hole in its mouth where you stuck a bottle of water and then it all came out the bottom. I thought she'd like that. I bought Steve a toy car that if you rolled it backwards on the carpet about three feet real fast and then let it go, it would go forward all by itself for about a foot. It was a bargain at 39 cents. I was the first through the checkout with my bag of gifts in hand, sitting by the front door. 
I was rather pleased with myself as I waited for my slow family. We got home and went to separate rooms to wrap our bounty, then slid them under the tree. My wrapping technique required inordinate amounts of tape and paper, but I did it all by myself. Christmas Eve couldn't come fast enough. The service ended at eight o'clock. By 8.05, we were home, changed into our pajamas and waiting for my dad. He had taken his time greeting the last of the folks at church. He had to turn out the lights, stop by his office and lock up. Pastors were like sea captains, the last one off the ship. Finally, we heard him coming through the back door. He ran in and got a fire started and then had to hurry back to the church office for something. Then the phone rang. We were all still in our places around the living room when dad finally returned and settled in. He got the Bible out and read the Christmas story to us, then the book of Isaiah. Then we had to have prayer. I didn't mind, really. Our family always prayed before something important, and I couldn't think of anything more important than opening Christmas presents. Finally, we were ready for the main event. Mom laid out the ground rules. We'd have to take turns. My older brother got to be Santa Claus. He distributed the packages one at a time, youngest to oldest, while my mother wrote down who got what and from whom on a little spiral notebook. That was for thank you notes later on. I'd studied every present under the tree for days. I lifted them, shook them, smelled them, and pressed down on the wrapping to see if I could see any letters or pictures through the paper. I never succeeded, but that didn't stop me from trying. We always started off with the lame stuff, pajamas, slippers, Vitalis hair tonic, soap on a rope, stuff that I could do without. They were things that say, if you were to be dropped off on a deserted island and you could only take a few items with you, they would not be at the top of your list. Eventually, we got to the better stuff, the presents we siblings got each other. I opened my present for my brother. It was a small model kit of a Navy submarine. Pretty cool. I reached under the tree to get the present I bought for him. It felt kind of warm. Paul began opening it. I couldn't wait to see the look of surprise on his face. He tore off the paper, looked at the picture on the front, then opened the box. Then he looked back at the picture. His face scrunched up and he gave me a funny look. He reached in the box and pulled out the hull of the model boat. It was warped and bent out of shape. It didn't take me long to figure it out. After I'd wrapped the present, I placed it under the tree, but right over the heat register. There it sat for two weeks. Paul stuffed the melted pieces back in the box and I heard him whisper under his breath, stupid present. I don't know if I heard him say it or if the words originated in my head. Either way, it was true, it was stupid. I felt bad, I was stupid. What was I thinking? All that money gone to waste and Kmart would never take it back. I'd try to make it up to him next year. It was my mom's turn next. She'd gotten a candy dish from somebody, a new set of dish cloths, and now my brother pulled out a bigger box and laid it in her lap. It was from my dad. She opened it with the same line she'd always say, well, what could this be? I hope you didn't spend too much, Frank. It was a white box with a picture and some printing on it. As she was unwrapping the paper, I could pick out the black red letters on the box. They read E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C-C-A-N O-P-E-N-E-R. Electric can opener. It was a fancy one, the kind that you mount under the wall cabinet. You plug it in and just slip the can in under the handle, press it down, and it turns all on its own like magic, and the lid comes off clean. There was even a little slot with a sharp blade in it to open bags of chips and stuff. It was magnificent. She let out a sigh and a big thank you to my dad. Oh, Frank, you shouldn't have. He was obviously pleased with himself. I wanted to crawl under the couch. I looked to see where my can opener was. It was still under the tree. I recognized it by the wrapping, red and green wrinkled paper with Christmas trees all over it. My can opener didn't come in a box. It was an odd shaped thing that was hard to wrap, so I used a lot of paper and loads of tape. After we went around again, it was my mom's turn. My brother reached way back under the tree and retrieved my present for her. She held it up 
looked it over. Well, what could this be? I hope you didn't spend a lot of money. No problem there, I thought to myself. All of a sudden, I wasn't so excited about Christmas. Mom carefully unwrapped the rolls of paper and tape. It took her a while. When she finally laid eyes on it, she opened her mouth wide and feigned surprise. The room was quiet until my brother reared back, kicked his legs in the air, and let out a whoop. It's another can opener! He didn't have to say any more. In fact, I don't think he said anything more, but I heard it. I heard it in my head, that same voice. Was it my brother's voice or my voice or from somewhere else? Either way, the words burned deep. Stupid present. My mom looked at me tenderly. She was good at that. She said, oh, thank you, Mark. And I knew that she knew what I was thinking as I mustered a sheepish half smile. I think this will be perfect to take to the cottage. Then we'll have one up there too. She was good at that too, making a bad situation seem not so bad. But I knew the truth. It was a stupid gift. I was outmaneuvered by my own dad. He had more money than me. I was terrible at Christmas. Well, before you grow too concerned about my fragile psyche, it's important for me to tell you that I eventually got over it. Life went on. Over the years, however, there were other things, other times when I heard that same voice, the voice we all hear from time to time. None of us are really sure of ourselves. We've blown it lots of times, said or done a stupid thing or worse. And we have all said or done something that hurts someone. The guilt comes easily and it carries us away in waves. Stupid gift. Nice try, loser. The voices are constant, and there are times we deserve it, I suppose. Our hearts are stained with the sludge of sin, cowardice, pride, lust, deception, and shame. We then cover them over with layers of shiny wrapping held together with lots of tape. Still, our Heavenly Father desires us. We are of no use to him, yet he wants us for himself. He wants to adopt us into his family, to make us his very own precious possession. Being God, he can make us come to him. He could force us to obey him, and then that wouldn't be love. He desires children, not slaves or robots. He desires our hearts but only as a freely offered gift. The very moment, however, when we think of giving ourselves to him, a voice hisses in our head, stupid present. But the Lord looks at the soiled, shriveled, warped, and broken offering of our lives, and he says lovingly, I'll take it. And he cherishes it, cherishes it most of all. So what do you give a big God who has everything what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. What I can, I give him, give him my heart. So would you consider yourself a good gift giver? Would you consider yourself one of these individuals that is good at giving gifts? Meaning that when you give a gift, to, to, whom, to whoever, the recipient of that gift looks at it and they kind of they study it a little bit and they realize how much thought you put into that. So really it's not about the gift whatsoever, it's really about the thought that's behind that, where you know that this person gets you, they understand you, they really kind of lean in, I mean they kind of, they know you, and, and therefore when they purchased this gift or gave you this gift, it was truly from their heart and you could feel it. That's what it means to be a good gift giver, right? I remember one time when uh, I was first married. I, this is when I was back in my 20s. I really wanted just something to veg out on from, from time to time. I wanted to, this is going to sound funny, but I wanted to play uh, Sony PlayStation 2, all right? That's what I wanted. They had a golf game on there, that Tiger Woods golf that I absolutely loved, and another football game perhaps the John Madden or the NCAA football uh, video games that I really, really enjoyed playing. 
Um, and so I kept hinting around to, to less about it, you know, and, and, and I, I basically came at it from, you know what, I don't want anything that I need. I want something that I want because I'm not going to go out and buy a Sony PlayStation just for the heck of it. You know, this could be a great Christmas gift, right? And so I kind of hinted and hinted. And then the Christmas came. And of course, I opened up that gift and it was a Sony PlayStation 2. And I was so happy. But then there was another gift she gave me that I was completely unaware of. And when I opened it up, it was a new wedding ring. It was a new wedding ring. And when she got that for me, I, when I opened it up and I looked at it, I could tell that this was her heart, that she had just given me a piece of her heart. That was an awesome Christmas gift. And I also got a Sony PlayStation 2. <laughs> I'm just kidding, kind of. But anyhow, so we're in our Christmas series, and we're calling it The Chronicles of Christmas. And we're going to be looking at some different stories but we're calling it the Chronicles of Christmas, if you can see it there, and it says their story, our story. And so we're going to take a little bit of a different approach this week, clear through our Christmas season, through Christmas Eve. Um, we're going to be taking a different approach, and we're going to be, I'm going to have someone come, just like we did today, we had Scott Earl come and read a story. Now, the stories that we're reading is out of a book that, from a pastor, he was a free Methodist pastor, and each Christmas Eve, he would write one of these stories. So the story you just heard called The Stupid Gift, that story was written by a pastor who pastored the Free Methodist Church in Spring Arbor. And he would write a story as such and deliver it on Christmas Eve. And that was their Christmas Eve service. And I thought it'd be kind of interesting, a creative way where we could take a look and read each one, read a story each week, and then just kind of talk about the, the, um, the emphasis of that story or the, or the main point of that story. So I will say this as a big disclaimer, this Christmas se series is either going to go really well and you're going to connect with it and you're going to really connect with the stories and they're going to communicate something to you and then we're just going to kind of wrap it up um, with God's Word. Or it could totally flop. So unless it goes really good, don't, I don't want to hear from you because if it goes bad and it flops, don't tell me. I already know. <laughs> Okay, so anyhow, I just think it'll be fun. So when we talk about their story, our story, we can kind of, we, we hear these stories and we can, we can extract something that applies to you and I. That's essentially what, and today we're talking about gifts, okay? You just heard, you know, the stupid gift, right? You might have been in that position, and maybe every Christmas we go through this, you know, we got to buy for someone that we don't, we just don't know what to buy for, or there may be some that we truly love and we want to put our hearts into it, but we're really struggling and we're really challenged, and sometimes it's just not fun anymore, right? It's just not fun anymore. And sometimes, you know, we've been burnt. We, we, maybe there's times where you have purchased a gift, just like from our story, and it kind of came up short and it made you felt you, it made you leave, made you feel kind of left you feeling kind of a little bit discouraged or down or whatever. But I hope that's not the case when we talk about this gift, because ultimately we're talking about the gift that God has given us, and it's far from being stupid, right? You know, in, in, um, so as we talk about gifts, and we talk about God's gift given to us, one of the greatest gifts ever given, that's what we're celebrating uh, this season and every se Christmas season, is the incarnation of Himself, God becoming flesh, the greatest gift ever. In fact, Paul writes this in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses, and we're going to look at chapter 2, 1 through, I think, 9 or 10 is what we're going to look at. But the first verse I'm going to share with you today, right now, is this. Uh, verse 8, and it goes a little bit into verse 9, but verse 8 says this. It says, uh, Paul is saying this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, and here it is, it is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. This concept of grace and salvation. Not just concept, but the, the, the grace. All about grace. Not a concept, of it, but literally grace. And the salvation of our souls is, is literally the gift from God. And so as we look at that, you know, we, we think about that. We think about that. Think about the gift that God has given each and every one of us, every single man, every single woman on this earth. Now, that doesn't mean we've all responded to that gift because His gift requires a response. It requires us to receive it and to lean into it, right? To receive it and to accept it. 
Um, and so that is the way his gift is. That's how, you know, to, in order to utilize and fully grasp God's gift of grace and salvation, you have to receive it. You have to accept it. And then you have to allow it to be uh, a part of who you are, which we'll talk about here in just a couple of moments. But we're talking about grace. And it's nothing that we can do on our own. Paul is telling us this has nothing to do with you. It's all about God. And if we would read the very first part of chapter 2, listen to it. and Listen to what makes this a great gift. This whole gift of grace and salvation. Listen to what makes it a great gift. In chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians, he says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which... You used to live when you followed the ways of this world, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3, all of us, we all lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. And God, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What makes this a great gift? Number one, I want you to just think about this. This is one of the great, this is the greatest gift that someone could ever give to you, and it's given to you by God Himself. This gift of grace and salvation. Paul tells us that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we can do to earn this gift, to receive this gift, to, to be um, to be given this gift because of something that we did. This concept, this, this salvation, this gift of grace and salvation. Paul's saying, let's not forget who has given you this gift. It's God Himself. And God has given you this gift. Think about the supremacy, the superiority of this gift, right? We can't boast about it. There's nothing I can say about my gift of salvation. There's nothing that you can say about your free gift of, of, of grace and salvation that God has given you. There's nothing that you can say about it. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. You weren't good enough. You didn't do enough. You didn't do any. In fact, it says, Paul tells us that when we were dead, and I don't know about you, but to me, when someone says you're dead, that means there's nothing to you anymore. You're just lying there. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. There's no human activity. There's no human involvement. You are dead. You are dead in your transgressions and your sins, which means that even if you, even if for, which is not the case, but even if you had a remote thought that you needed salvation, there's nothing that you could do because you are dead in your transgressions and sins. There's nothing that you can do. That's what makes this gift such a, an incredible gift is because God is saying, I know there's nothing you can do about this. You have the curse of sin. You are separated from me. You are my enemy. I, my wrath is on you per se. It's kind of hard to understand that because God loves us so much that He comes to us and He says, but I still want to give you this gift of grace and salvation. Nothing that you've done, but this free gift of grace and salvation. That's what makes this such an incredible gift. Number one is that God Himself, Yahweh Himself is giving us this gift. Number one, or number, let me just say in partly uh, to number one, is that because only He could pull this off. There's nothing that you and I could do. That's what it means to be literally dead in our sins and transgressions. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that I can do. We can't even lift our heads up to pray to God. We don't have that ability. We don't have so only God can provide this incredible gift of grace and salvation. What a gift. What an incredible gift. This gift of grace and salvation that says you are so far away from me. You are so broken. You are so dead in your sins and transgressions that there is nothing you could do to even, to even recognize that you need me. But yet I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you and I'm giving you this free gift. What will you do with it? Will you receive it? And if you receive it, what will then take place? 
Because Paul tells us, and I love, I love this passage of Scripture, because he would go on to talk about us being the workmanship of Jesus Christ, of God Himself. We are the workmanship. I mean, he tells us that, you know, that we used to be the same as these other people. We were dead in our... In fact, we followed the ways. We sinned. We transgressed. We did what we wanted to do. We were disobedient to Him. We gratified our earthly, our cravings of the flesh, and we followed its desires and thoughts. That's who we were. But God comes to us and He says, I want to give you this gift of grace and salvation. I want to regenerate you. I want to give you a new heart. I want to love you. I want to love on you. I want you to be able to love me. I want to have a relationship with you. And he says, this is by grace that you've been saved. And it says, it it says in order, in verse seven, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And that's exactly what God is doing, is expressing his incredible kindness, his loving kindnesses, His unconditional love to us through this gift of grace and salvation. You want to talk about a Christmas gift. This is the Christmas gift that keeps on giving. You want to talk about the perfect gift, not a stupid gift by any means, not a human gift at any level, but we're talking about a gift that is absolutely uh, ineffable. We don't have the words to even comprehend the weight and gravity of His grace and salvation. But it's a gift that He's given us. The question becomes, will you receive it? And then, more importantly, what will you do with it? Because it says that we are called to, we've been given this gift to do good works in which He's prepared us to do before time. He's given us this gift for a reason, to do good works, to bring Him glory. And so the response of receiving this gift, the question would be, what do we give back to God? What on earth could we ever give back to God that would show our incredible graciousness for the gift that He's given us? And there's really only one thing that He's asking for and only one thing that we have that we can truly give God. There's only one thing that you and I can truly give God, and that is our hearts. So the question becomes, will we give Him our hearts? Like we said last week, not one third, not one half, not three quarters, not a fourth, not almost all of it, but giving Him all of our hearts. Again, looking at that prayer of David in Psalm 51 and some other Psalms where David is coming clean with God and he's saying, God, you know, create in me a new heart. Give me a clean heart. Just like in the Gospels when Nicodemus, where Jesus says, you've got to be born again. We have a new heart through salvation, through grace and salvation, through receiving this gift. We have this new heart. What are we going to do with the heart? Are we going to give and submit our heart to Christ? Or are we going to try to stay in control of our hearts? And I hope this Christmas that as we look at, as we go through these different stories, Just like today, we're talking about a gift and we're talking about the perfect gift that God has given us. And what can we give to someone who's ever, you know, just like if someone has leaned into you, my wife leaning into me and giving me that ring that Christmas, I mean, it just melted my heart. And that's just another human that I love, a human reaching into me. Can you imagine, what does it do to my heart when I receive the gift of grace and salvation? Does it melt my heart? Does it make me want to just love on him like I want to love on my wife when she gave me that gift because it just melted me? Is my heart melted to say, here, God, here's my heart. Take my heart. You take my heart. And the one, please create in me a clean heart. Create in me a new, clean heart that has the desire to follow hard after you. I hope that is my prayer for you. And I hope that you have just, I hope you have an incredible Christmas this year as you, as we, you know, and especially as we engage in this series and we listen to these stories. And then on the backside, we just talk about it for a few moments. I hope that it rekindles a love and a passion for, you know, to understand this gift that God has given us of grace and salvation. And I hope we never take that, and I hope we never devalue it or minimize it, but we understand that the correct response is to turn back to God and literally give Him our hearts, control of who we are. It was great being with you this week. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas as you begin this particular season. But I pray that you would just spend a few moments in Ephesians chapter 2, read through those verses again this week, and just allow them to warm your hearts knowing that God leaned into you. God loved you so much 
that He extended His free gift of grace and salvation to you, to you. The question becomes, have you opened it? Have you received it? Are you living it out? Does He have your heart? I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you back here next week. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, and let the king of my heart You're never gonna let me down